Tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. How would you answer that question? You're right, this is a rhetorical question I don't expect you all to answer right now. If you think about this and you're smart, you might say, eh, that depends on who's asking. And you'd be right. If you're in a job interview and somebody says, tell me about yourself, you're probably going to talk about your education, your job experience, maybe even your personality. Say, I'm a very energetic and self-motivated person. If you're going to a counselor because you've been having tr pr trouble in your marriage or struggling with your mental health, you might describe your family of origin or talk about the difficulties that you've been having in your marriage. If you're at Church of the Brethren annual conference and somebody asks you, who are you? They probably want to know who you're related to so that they can figure out if they know members of your extended family. It's good to know what context you're talking about because switching these up is not a good thing. If you're in a job interview and somebody says, tell me about yourself, and you talk about how you fight with your husband all, your, all the time because your mother never understood you, that interview is probably not going to go very well. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the clearest look we get at the identity of Jesus. The writers come from different perspectives and are writing for different audiences. Matthew underscores Jesus' identity as a Jewish rabbi. John is more of a mystic who writes about how Jesus' identity will be revealed to those who believe in him. Mark does a clever thing in chapter 8, verses 27, 33, because Mark has Jesus ask the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, mm, John the Baptist, Elijah, a prophet. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter has the right answer. You are the Messiah. And Jesus says, that is correct. And in the very next verse, Jesus starts preaching about what it means to be the Messiah and Peter pulls him aside and says, uh, you might want to lighten up on that whole suffering and death thing. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's pretty strong stuff. Our text from John chapter 8 is part of the larger context of the people, the disciples, and the Pharisees, especially the Pharisees, trying to figure out who Jesus is. The Pharisees aren't merely curious. Their authority is threatened by Jesus and his teaching. And people in power who have their authority threatened can be really nasty. The Pharisees aren't lawyers in the conventional Western sense of that word, but they are professional questioners. They have been intensely trained in the law to ask questions and pick out inconsistencies and weaknesses in the answers. They are trying to trap Jesus into an answer that will be against the law so they can bring him up in front of the authorities. And inevitably, the Pharisees and even the Jews who believe Jesus and are trying to figure out who he is, ask questions which reveal more about who they are than about who Jesus is. That's part of the text where we are in John 8:31. And the question I would like us to consider this morning is not only who are you or who am I, but who am I in relation to Jesus? 
I know that many of you identify yourselves as followers of Jesus. Now, that might not be the first thing you lead with in every tell me about yourself moment. In that job interview, you might not start out by identifying yourself as a follower of Jesus, unless you're interviewing with a search committee at a congregation where you wanna be the pastor and then that had better be part of the conversation. But I think it's well worth some effort to think about how being a follower of Jesus affects our identity. If you have parts of your life that you don't think have anything to do with being a follower of Jesus, that's an interesting thing to consider too. I remember a conversation I had at work with a colleague many years ago who told me, why can't you just be like Jeff? He's a Christian, but you'd never know it. <laughs> that wasn't meant as a compliment, but I took it as one. In John 8, Jew Jesus is speaking to Jewish believers about how the truth will make them free. And they say, we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. Which is a really interesting thing to say because the descendants of Abraham were enslaved by the Egyptians a thousand years ago. And the whole Jewish identity was based on the fact that they were God's chosen people who were led out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. Sometimes the things that we assert with the most conviction are actually the opposite of what is true. Things like, I can stop drinking anytime I want. I don't have an anger problem. My family doesn't have any secrets. The very things that we say the most definitely are sometimes the places where we have missed the boat. These Jews are so captivated by their special identity as descendants of Abraham that it's keeping them from claiming their identity as children of God. They're protecting their narrow identity as the religious elite and have completely missed that they're children of the king. They've completely missed that the way to freedom and truth is right there in front of them. Here's the recipe that Jesus gives for identity and life in John 8, 31. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, let's see, where have we heard words about continuing the work and identity? Maybe here, in this tagline from the Church of the Brethren. It reads, continuing the work of Jesus simply, peacefully, together. Have any of you heard that before? you might own a royal blue t-shirt, long sleeve, short sleeve, 50-50, quick dry, that says Creekside on the front, and on the back it says, continuing the work of Jesus peacefully, simply, together. This art was created by calligrapher Timothy Botts, who is from Wheaton, Illinois. A framed version of this print hangs in two places in the Creekside Church. Can you tell me where those are? Where? In the library, in the conference room. Where's the other place? The youth room. The youth room. Our conference room and the youth room. Now, Obviously, there's more to being a disciple than what is printed on your t-shirt. 
or what hangs in your meeting room, but I hope that those things will serve as reminders for us. Our identity as disciples is not about our education or our work experience or our family history or even our personality. Those things are part of who, they, who we are, but they don't make us followers of Jesus. Our identity lies in how we continue the work of Jesus, how our discipleship influences our employment, how we interact with our families, and how we express discipleship in the context of our own unique personality and gifts. Each and every one of us have things that enslave us, especially those who say, I have it all figured out. Each and every one of us can experience the truth and freedom which comes from Jesus Christ. Because we're all children of the King. When we know that we are loved by God and that our freedom is in Jesus Christ, then we can discover the work which we are being called to do. You've already heard this morning about some of the people at Creekside who feel called to continue that work by teaching. Children, adults, youth. You will have an opportunity immediately after this service to assemble in the gathering area and hear about other ministries of this congregation and to ask leaders about their vision for the future. I think Congregational business meeting is a little bit of an unfortunate name. First of all, it's really long to say, but it also reduces continuing the work of Jesus to doing business. I know there are things we need to do in regard to budgeting financial resources for the coming year, and people who you will call into leadership to represent this congregation at the local and national level. In my mind, these things are ministry, not business. Business is continuing our work. Ministry is continuing the work of Jesus. I hope you'll join us for the conversation following worship. Members, not yet members, friends, you're all welcome. We all serve the same God and follow the one Christ and enjoy the same fellowship of believers. And we all have work to do, but it's work that's not for our sake alone. It's planning for the kingdom of God and how this congregation in this place is claiming a vision for proclaiming the truth and freedom of Jesus Christ. I hope we can continue the work of Jesus peacefully, simply, together. Amen.